In this lecture, we shall discuss the law on co-ownership in Ghana. Co-ownership in Ghana. So when we talk of co-ownership, co-ownership essentially refers to the simultaneous enjoyment of land by two or more persons. Simultaneous enjoyment of land by two or more persons. At the same time, it means that you have a land and then two or more persons are enjoying rights of ownership over the land at the same time. So it is, let's say, one parcel of land and then five people are exercising rights of ownership over the land at the same time. That brings us to what we call concurrent ownership of land. Now, this concurrent ownership of land, it can take two main forms. Two main forms. Concurrent ownership of land can take two main forms. One, it can come in the form of a joint tenancy. It can come in the form of a joint tenancy. Or it can also come in the form of a tenancy in common. It can come in the form of a joint tenancy, or it can come in the form of a tenancy in common. Now, it is important to note over here that joint tenancy and tenancy in common are the two principal ways by which you can have concurrent ownership in land. Now, tenancy over here does not refer to a leasehold interest. The tenancy over here is a description given to the type of co-ownership enjoyed by the co-owners. The tenancy over here does not refer to a leasehold interest. It only refers to the type of co-ownership enjoyed by the co-owners. Now, it is important to note that when we refer to co-ownership of land, we are referring to simultaneous enjoyment of land by two or more persons. Now, as indicated already, there are two principal ways in which co-ownership can arise. It can arise in the form of a joint tenancy or it can arise in the form of a tenancy in common. So then we have to look at what the common law says. Under the common law, when two or more persons, both natural and artificial, when two or more persons, both natural and artificial, acquire or hold an interest in land, then the common law says that they hold it as joint tenants as joint tenants. So what then is a joint tenancy? What then is a joint tenancy? Now, when we say land is a subject of a joint tenancy, then it means that if you have two, three, four, five, I mean two or more people holding a land on the basis of a joint tenancy, then what it means is that each owner, each co-owner, is treated as being entitled to the whole of that land. What this means is that there are no distinct shares, there are no separate shares of the land, or no single owner can claim to have any greater rights or a greater part of the land than the other person. It means that when you see the land, you see the land as one belonging to four people. You cannot pinpoint one person or one co-owner and say that that co-owner enjoys this particular portion of the land. No. Each co-owner is treated as being entitled to the whole of that land. And there are no distinct shares or apportionments to each co-owner. In other words, no co-owner can claim to have 
a greater right of the land over the other person. What this means is that as far as the rest of the world is concerned, the land is treated as if it is owned by one person only. And all of the other joint tenants share in that one ownership. Therefore, if you have a land, let's say about 100 acres of land, and four farmers own, co own the land under a joint tenancy, it is not possible to say that they own one quarter each of the land. Each of them owns the whole of the land. There are no shares, there are no partitions of the land. What exists under a joint tenancy is a right of ownership of the whole land, and this right of ownership is enjoyed simultaneously with all of the other owners of the land. Now, the most significant aspect of a joint tenancy is what you call the right of survivorship or use acquisendi. The right of survivorship or use acquisendi. What, the, what, the, what does this mean? What this right of survivorship means is that under a joint tenancy, when a person who is a joint tenant dies, then the person's interests will accrue to the surviving joint tenants. In other words, if we have a property that is owned by four people as joint tenants, with each of them having a stake in the property as a joint tenant, it means that if one joint tenant dies during the existence of the joint tenancy, the surviving joint tenants, that's the three remaining people, each of them, the interest that belong to the one who has not died would accrue to the remaining three people. Out of the remaining three, if one of them two dies, then that person who has died interest would now accrue onto the remaining two. And out of the remaining two, if one of them dies, that person's interest would accrue to the last person. It means that the last person will take the whole property and enjoy it 100%. And then when that last person dies, then he can then give his interest to his descendants or his children. So what it means is that if property is owned by a joint tenants and they are five in number, when one joint tenant dies, there is no need for a formal conveyance or any written document to reflect the new owners. This is because the moment one person dies, automatically his interest accrues to the remaining joint tenants. One question that has arisen under joint tenancy is whether a joint tenant can transfer his interest in his will. So that if property is owned by four people as joint tenants, can one person say that I give the share I own in this property that I own jointly with my wife and my children. I give my share to my partner at work. Is it possible to say so? The answer is an outright no. There's no way a joint tenant can give his share of his interest to anybody in the will. This is because of the right of survivorship. Because the very moment and the very second the joint tenant dies, 
His interests are glues under the use acquiescence under the right of survivorship. His interests are glues to the surviving joint tenants. And so, if his interests are accrued to the surviving joint tenants, it means that there's nothing to be given under his will to any person. Because the moment you die, automatically your interest accrues to the other surviving joint tenants. Now, one possible and positive effect of a joint tenancy is that it may relieve you of the need of having to draft a new document whenever one person dies. Because if the property is being held under a joint tenancy, then it follows that as soon as one person dies, his interest automatically accrues to the surviving joint tenants. But it may also be unfair because it means that even though I may have 12 to acquire a property with my partners, four of them, if we hold the property under a joint tenancy, it means that the very moment I die, my descendants, my children cannot have any share in the property. It would rather go to the surviving joint tenants. So that is the essential characteristic of a joint tenancy, that we have what we call the right of survivorship, which is called the use acquisendi. Now, having finished with the essential characteristic of a joint tenancy. Let us now proceed to look at what the requirements of a joint tenancy are. What are the requirements of a joint tenancy? Now, the law is that before any joint tenancy can exist, then we have four unities that must be present. There are four unities that must be present before a joint tenancy can be found to exist. It is important to note that if any of these four unities are absent, then there will be no joint tenancy. In other words, all of these unities must exist before you can have a joint tenancy. This is the essential distinction between a joint tenancy and a tenancy in common. So what are the four requirements of a joint tenancy? There must be unity of possession. There must be unity of interest. There must be unity of title. And there must be unity of time. Now, when we say unity of time, what do we mean? Unity of time essentially means that the interest of each of the joint tenants must vest at the same time. The interest of each of the joint tenants must vest at the same time. So for example, if you have a document or a deed or an instrument saying that the, the land belongs to Ama for Ama's life, and it, it, it then belongs to Kwame forever after Ahmed's death. There's no way this can be a joint, a joint tenancy. This is because Ahmed's interest is for her life. And if after Ahmed has passed on, that the property will go to Kwame forever. It, there cannot, this cannot be a joint tenancy. Because as we have said, for a joint tenancy to exist, there must be unity of time. Unity of time meaning that the interest of each joint tenant must arise at the very same time. And therefore, let me give another scenario. That if a, a woman purchases a house in 2001 and then in 2020, when the woman got married, the woman ended up granting an equal share in her house to her husband. They cannot be joint tenants. 
They cannot be joint tenants. They cannot be joint tenants because the woman acquired her interest in the land in 2001. And she has granted the husband an equal share in the property in 2020. The interest of the co-owners arose at different times. And therefore, there is no unity of time. So there is no joint tenancy in this case. However, with this same scenario, if the wife wants to create a joint tenancy, then even though she bought the property in 2001, in 2020, when she got married, what she had to do was to reconvey the entire house into the joint names of herself and her husband and her husband rather than simply giving the husband a share in the property. So if the wife reconveys the entire house into the joint names of herself and her husband, then that one, we can have a joint tenancy because their interest will not begin to run at the same time. It will begin to run from the time that the wife reconveyed the house into the joint names of herself and then her husband. But if the wife just goes ahead to simply grant him a share in 2020, then that one, the law is that there is no joint tenancy because there is no unity of time. So that is one of the requirements of a joint tenancy. There must be unity of time. Then the next requirement is that there must be unity of title. There must be unity of title. Then when we say unity of title, what we mean is that each of the joint tenants must claim his title under the same instruments, under the same instruments, transaction or an act. They must derive their interest or title from the same title document. So if the person holding the interests as joint tenants, if they do not derive their title from the same transaction, or if the joint tenants do not derive their title from the same instrument, then they cannot be holding it as joint tenants. So for a joint tenancy to arise, there must be unity of title, meaning that each joint tenant must claim his title under the same instrument, under the same transaction, or under the same act. And therefore, if the very people who are holding the interest do not derive the title from the same transaction or from the same instrument, then they cannot be holding it as joint tenants. So you can have unity of title in the following scenarios I'm about to give. One. If all the joint tenants acquire their rights by the same conveyance, then they would, would have unity of title and they will be joint tenants. If they all acquire their rights by the same conveyance, so in the same conveyance, the same deed of conveyance is what conveyed the interest to all of the joint tenants. We have unity of title. Number two, if the joint tenant simultaneously took possession of the land and they acquire title to it by adverse possession, there's unity of title. Because they acquired their title and they are claiming the title through the same act of adverse possession. They are joint tenants. So when we say unity of title, it doesn't necessarily mean that it must definitely be a document. You can be joint tenant if you simultaneously acquire land by adverse possessions. 
And let me also explain to you that there are certain circumstances in which estate owners, that estate owners may have a joint tenancy, even though as a matter of formality, these estate owners have each signed different documents. What I'm saying is that even though we are saying that under a joint tenancy, there must be unity of title, you can have a joint tenancy whereby estate owners may have signed different owners. So let's say Kofi signed a different document, Ama signed a different document over the same house, over the same apartment, but the law will still recognize them as joint tenants and there will still be unity of title. Let me explain this with the case of Antoniades versus Villiers. Antoniades spells A N T O N I A D E S versus Villiers. Villiers spells V I L L I E R S. In this case, an unmarried couple took a lease of a one bedroom flat and they signed separate documents. And they signed separate documents. Now, in the circumstances, the circumstances which included the fact that the landlord had provided a double bed and there was only one bedroom, the court took the view that it would be rather absurd to regard these two people as having separate and independent rights to the land. And therefore, in this case, the House of Laws held that as a matter of law, even though the two persons had each signed different documents, the House of Laws still regarded that the joint tenants derived their title from the same document. And this was the case, even though there was more than one piece of paper that they had signed, each person had signed a different document. And therefore, all we are saying over here is that even though people may have signed different documents, we could still have unity of title, especially if they are deriving their title from the very same person and it was the same property. So please watch out. The mere fact that different documents have been signed by the co-owners does not mean that we do not have unity of title and there's no joint tenancy. And so that is the case of Antoniades versus Villiers, reported in 1988 to All England Reports at page 309. So we have dealt with unity of time and unity of title. Now we go to the third U, the third unity, which is the unity of interests. When we say unity of interests, once again, this is also another requirement that has to be established before we can infer that there is the existence of a joint tenancy. So unity of interest. When we say unity of interest, what do we mean? What we mean is that each joint tenant, the interest that each joint tenant has must be the same in extent it must be the same in nature and it must be the same in duration. This is because the all hold as one estate. So you can't have a situation whereby one joint tenant is having a leasehold and the other joint tenant is having a freehold. You can't have a situation whereby one joint tenant is having a free simple and the other joint tenant is having a fee too, is not possible. So, for unity of interest to exist, 
the interest of each joint tenant must be the same in extent, it must be the same in nature, and it must be the same in duration. Because in law, they all hold one estate. Now, what this means is this. It means that although in theory of law, we have said already that each joint tenant owns the whole of the property. Although in theory of law, we have said that when rent is accrued, when rent, when we get rent from the property that we own as joint tenants, one person cannot say that he is the one going to take the full amount of money. This is because as soon as the $100,000 falls into the account, remember, we have unity of interest, which means that the interest of each joint tenant is the same in extent, it's, it's the same in nature, and it's the same in duration. So the very moment the $100,000 gets into the account, the proceeds must be shared equally among all the joint tenants because we all have a unity of interests. And like I've said, once we have unity of interests, it means that one person cannot have a freehold for the other person to have a leasehold. One person cannot have a fee simple and for the other person to have a fee too. Once you have a joint tenancy, all joint tenants must be either holders of a freehold or all joint tenants must be holders of a leasehold or all joint tenants must be holders of the remainder in possession, as the case may be. You cannot have a joint tenancy for people to have different interests. Each joint tenant must have the same interests and the interest must be the same in extent, it must be the same in nature, and it must be the same in duration. Then we have the next requirement of a joint tenancy, which is unity of possession. What unity of possession means is that each joint tenant is entitled to physical possession of the whole land. What this means is that once a joint tenancy exists, there can be no physical division of the land. And there can also be no restriction on any joint tenant's use of any part of the land. Unity of possession means that all of the joint tenants should be entitled to any part, any part of the land. It means that once we have unity of possession, then each co-owner must have full rights to fully participate in the fruits of the possession so that if there is any rent that is obtained from the land, the fruit of the possession, because I have full right over any portion of the land, one joint tenant cannot say that that portion of the land that he rented, it belongs to he alone. So he alone is supposed to enjoy the proceeds from that portion. So for example, if five owners, five co-owners own five plots of land as joint tenants, and one plot of land is rented out and the proceeds have been paid into a bank account, one of the joint owners cannot say that it is his portion of the land that has been rented out, and so he alone is entitled to the proceeds or the profits from that portion. This is because there is unity of possession, meaning that each joint tenant has an entitlement to any portion of the land. It means that the fruits of that possession, the rent claimed from that, that, that possession, can go to all the joint tenants. One person does not have the right to say that he alone is entitled to the rent from a particular portion. So, under joint tenancy, no joint tenant should have the right to point to any part of the land and say that that portion of the land is his portion to the exclusion of the others. 
So these are the four unities of a joint tenancy. Unity of time, unity of title, unity of interest, and unity of possession. Now, having explained joint tenancy, having explained right of survivorship, and having explained the four requirements that must be established before a joint tenancy can be deemed to exist, what then is the manner and way in which a joint tenancy can be terminated? What are the ways in which a joint tenancy can be terminated? Now, it is important to note that the common law recognizes three different ways in which it is possible to sever or terminate a joint tenancy. And these three ways that the common law identified, they have been outlined in the case of Williams versus Hensman. Williams and Hensman is reported as far back as in the year 1861 in one J and H report at page four, 546, 1861. As far back as in 1861, Williams versus Hensman. Williams is spelled W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S versus Hensman, H-E-N-S-M-A-N. This case provides three principal ways in which a joint tenancy can be terminated. And the three ways are as follows. One, one is what we call an act of operation on his own share. An act of operation on his own share. Or we can simply put it as an alienation of the joint tenant's own share. So, an alienation of the joint tenant's own share is one of the ways mentioned in Williams versus Hensman about how a joint tenancy can be terminated or severed. Number two, where the joint tenants agree to sever their interest by mutual agreement. And number three, by mutual conduct. By mutual conduct. So in William and Hensman, you will see three principal ways in which a joint tenancy can be severed. And they are one, an act of operation on his own share, or what we can describe as an act of alienation by of a joint tenant's own share. Number two, where joint tenants agree to sever their interest by mutual agreement. And number three, by mutual conduct. These are the three ways mentioned in 1861 in the case of Williams as Hensman. But there can be a fourth way of terminating a joint tenancy. And that is what we've mentioned before. It is what we call the right of survivorship. Because when one person dies, the other person dies, the moment the penultimate person dies, the last but one. The moment the last but one dies and we have one man standing, then joint tenancy has come to an end. Because the last man standing takes everything for himself. So let us now take each of these three ways mentioned in Williams and Hensman and then explain them. One, an act operation on his own share or alienation of a joint tenant's own share. What this means is that if you have a joint tenancy and there are four people that own the property as co-owners, as joint tenants. Now, if one co-owner seeks to deal with his share, his share, and he says that he no longer wants to be a part of the joint tenancy, so that joint owner deals with his own share, severs that share from the joint tenancy, and sells his share to a third party, then by selling his share to a third party, it means that he has alienated his share and he has taken himself out of the joint tenancy. But remember, remember, as we have said already, 
you cannot transfer your share that you have in a joint tenancy by testamentary disposition in your will. If you want to transfer it, it must be in your lifetime. If you make an attempt to transfer it in your will, then it is going to be a big problem. Because the moment you die, youth accrescent day will kick in and then your interest would accrue to the surviving joint tenants. So if you want authority for the position that you cannot transfer your interest in a joint tenancy by testamentary disposition, I refer you to the case of Bankers Trusts versus Namda. Namda is spelled N-A-M for Mango, D-A-R. Bankers Trust versus Namda, 1997. NPC at page 22. That case lays down the position that you cannot transfer your interest in a joint tenancy by testamentary disposition. And so if you want to sever your interest in a joint tenancy, you must make sure that you do it in your lifetime. And you must make sure that the manner in which you transfer it, the law must be, you must comply with the formalities of the law. So if the law in your country is that before you transfer an interest in land, it must be in writing. You must make sure that you have transferred your interest in writing. Now, the question is this. If a property is held by five people, five people, and then one joint tenant alienates his interest to a third party, will the fact of that alienation bring the whole joint tenancy to an end or it will only take one person out of the joint tenancy such that the remaining four people will continue to exist as joint tenants. In other words, after the act of severance has occurred, that the severance terminates the whole joint tenancy and brings everything to an end or if they are three or more joint tenants, and one person takes himself out and alienates his interest, can the remaining joint tenants continue to exist as joint tenants? The answer to this question is very simple. If there are 15 people that own property as joint tenants, and one person alienates his interest to a third party, the remaining 14 people will continue to hold the property, the, the remainder of the property as joint Tenants. And, and you see this point at page 191 of the book titled Modern Land Law, written by Martin Dixon, the ninth edition, page 191. And this is what the learned order says, and I quote at page 191. I'm quoting After severance has occurred, if there were only two tenants, necessarily both are not tenants in common. But if there were three or more joint tenants, the others can remain as joint tenants between themselves. So if land is held by A, B, C, and D as legal and equitable joint tenants, and then C and D carry out an act of severance. Equitable title now exists as a joint tenancy between A and D, with C and D as tenants in common. And the quote ends. Why is it that it is between A and B as tenants, as joint tenants? It is because A, B, and C were holding the land as joint tenants. And it is only C and D who carried out an act of severance. So Martin Dixon is saying that A and B who didn't touch their joint tenancy, they will continue as joint tenants. But remember that if there are only two joint tenants and one person carries an act of alienation, it will have the effect of converting and terminating the joint tenancy to rather bring into existence a tenancy in common. And the Supreme Court in Ghana has also affirmed this in the case of Paul Adumako 
Victoria Adumako versus Mrs. Owusu Isiedu. Series number J4 stroke 25, 2007. And the judgment is dated 7th of May, 2008. That the band JSC said as follows, and I quote, alienation by a joint tenant of his or her interests without the knowledge or consent of the other joint tenant would usually be an act of severance by which the joint tenancy is converted into a tenancy in common. An act of severance determines the joint tenancy. Full stop. And then that the bank goes ahead to refer to the case of First National Securities versus Hegarty reported in 1985, one Queen's bench at page 850. So what they concede is that when there are two joint tenants and one person transfers or alienates his interest, that act of alienation would amount to a termination of the joint tenancy and rather bring into existence a tenancy in common. So that is one way of terminating a joint tenancy. One, by an act of, of an act operation on his own share or an alienation of a joint tenant's own share. Number two is when the joint tenants agree to sever their interests by mutual agreement. Where joint tenants agree to sever their interests by mutual agreement. And you see that in the case of Williams versus Hensman. Williams versus Hensman. Hensman is both H-E-N-S-M-A-N, Williams versus Hensman. Now, what happened, what, what, what are we saying is the mode of terminating a joint tenancy by an act of mutual agreement? It means that if two or more people, if six people own property by a joint tenancy and they agree among themselves to terminate the joint tenancy, and so the six people agree to partition and share the properties for themselves. Each person is carving out his own interest for himself. Then the joint tenancy will be deemed to have been terminated because it will not be converted into a joint tenancy because all the co-owners have agreed to carve out their respective interests for themselves. But what is important is that the agreement must contemplate an intention to sever the joint tenancy and not merely an agreement to use the property. So if they divided it only for the purpose of using it, that will not be enough. It must be an agreement where you can infer an intention that these people intend to sever the joint tenancy. And so if you look at the case of Davis and Smith, Davis is spelled D-A-V-I-S versus Smith. Reported in 2011, EWCA Civil Act 1603. The court noted that an agreement by a couple who own property as joint tenants, the agreement by the couple to put their house on the market and share their process, that agreement to put the house on the market, it was itself not sufficient to sever the joint tenancy by mutual agreement. So that mere agreement to sell was not enough to say that the joint tenancy had been terminated. The court noted that there must be more. And in fact, in this case, the court realized that there were more evidence on record from which they invariably were able to infer that the joint tenancy had been terminated. But what I want to point out to you in Davis and Smith is that the court noted that the mere agreement by the couple to put their house on the market and sell the proceeds and, and share the proceeds was not in itself sufficient to terminate the joint tenancy. And, and, and the court relied, and the court in coming to that conclusion relied on the case of Marshall versus Marshall, reported in 1998 EWCA Civil at page 1467. That's an agreement by a separating couple to put their house on the market and sell was not of itself sufficient to sever the agreement, sever the joint tenancy. Therefore, if you have a joint tenancy and the parties agree to 
partition and apportion their respective interests, then that will terminate the joint tenancy and make it a tenancy in common. That is the second way. So we've seen two ways we can terminate a joint tenancy. One is when you have one person alienating his share. And the other is when you have a joint tenant agreeing to sever by mutual agreement. And all of these are mentioned in the case of Williams versus Hensman. That was decided in 1861. The third mode of terminating a joint tenancy mentioned in Williams and Hensman is, by, is terminating by mutual conduct, by mutual conduct. This is in situations whereby the joint tenants have by their own conduct demonstrated that they are not intending to go ahead with the joint tenancy anymore. One example of a way that can be, we can infer terminating by mutual conduct is when you have a land, five acres, and then there are five co-owners and they have all fenced their portions and they have put a gate over there and you don't allow one person to come onto you, another person's land. And you've been doing this for the past 50 years. It means that for the past 50 years, you, you people are not having, you're not exercising unity of possession. It means that by your own conduct, you have shown that you don't want to have a joint tenancy. So even though there's no agreement, but we can infer that this land, these parties have partitioned each portion for themselves and they are fenced. We are told that that is a way in which we can infer that the joint tenancy has been terminated. And as mentioned earlier, these are the three ways mentioned in Williams and Hensman. One, when one person alienates his share. Two is when there's mutual agreement to terminate the joint tenancy. And three is when there's mutual conduct showing that they do not intend to go ahead with the joint tenancy anymore. The final one, which I mentioned, is by the operation of the right of survivorship, which means that if people have their own rights and then they die, their right goes on to the surviving joint tenants. So when they move on to the surviving joint tenants until it gets the last person, the moment it gets the last person, then the joint tenancy has come to an end. So these are the requirements of joint tenancy. These are the ways in which a joint tenancy can be terminated. What then is now a tenancy in common? Please, for tenancy in common, there is no right of survivorship. What you need to know is that when you have a property owned by two people as tenants in common, each person has a distinct share in the property. And when he dies, his interest can go through his will to his descendants, or he can, he can decide who his interest should go to. So in tenancy in common, there's no right of survivorship. Each co-owner has a distinct share in the property. And when he dies, his interest will move on to his surviving uh, descendants. So he can pass on his interest in the will. So in tenancy in common, there is no, there is no right of survivorship or use acquisendi. Each person has a distinct interest in the property. So we have gone through joint tenancy. We know what common, we know what tenancy in common is. Now let's come to the position in Ghana. Remember that I mentioned earlier that when you have a common law where two or more people own property together, then the presumption is that they hold it as joint tenants. That is the presumption at common law. Unless they themselves mention that they are holding sustenance in common, the law is that when two or more people own property together, the presumption is that they hold it as joint tenants. What is the position in Ghana? Now, the, this common law position was the one that was applicable in Ghana for a long time until we had the Conveyancing Act of 1973 and LCD 323. This law came into force on the 1st of January, 1974. Now, before this law came into force, the law was that when people own property together in Ghana, 
the presumption is that they hold it as joint tenants. But when this law came into force, we had a provision under section 14.3, section 14, subsection 3, which had the effect of making a conveyance in, in to a conveyance of an interest in land made to two or more persons. The law was that it creates a presumption that there was a tenancy in common and not a joint tenancy. It means that from 1st of January 1974, when you have a property conveyed to two or more people in Ghana, the presumption is that they hold it as tenants in common and not joint tenants. It's a presumption because when the parties themselves express in the document that they want to hold it as joint tenants, as for that one, the law will give effect to their intention. But if you don't have that in the document, the when two people own property together from 1st of January 1974, the law was that there will be a presumption that they hold it as tenants in common and not joint tenants. So the import of the Conveyancing Act of 1973, NRCD 175, NRCD 175. Sorry, I mentioned 1323 initially. It's NRCD 175. So Conveyancing Act of 1973, NRCD 175, Section 14.3 says that when there's a conveyance of land to two or more persons from 1st of January 1974, it will be deemed to convey a tenancy in common. That will be the presumption. Now, it is important to note that this conveyancing act has been repealed by the Land Act of 2020 at 1030. The Land Act of 2020 at 1036 has repealed this conveyancing act, but it has reenacted and reproduced what we have in the section 14.3. So in the last act of 2020, Act 6, if you look at section 40, subsection 3, section 4, subsection 3, 43, it says that a conveyance of an interest in land to two or more persons creates a tenancy in common and not a joint tenancy, unless the people themselves express that they want to take it as joint tenants. So once again, we have reproduced that particular provision under at 10 to the 6, that when property is conveyed to two or more people, they will presume to hold it as tenants in common and not joint tenants. Now, there's a case law in Ghana that you must all be very familiar with as far as joint tenancy and tenancy in common is concerned. It's the case of Fenuku and another versus John Tang and another. Fenuku and another versus John Tang and another reported in 2001, 2002, Supreme Court of Ghana law reports at page 985, is the property in question acquired by a couple in 1954. It was acquired in 1954. Their wife died and in 1954, they acquired it as joint tenants. They acquired it jointly. And in 1958, the wife died. And so, Later, later on, the surviving spouse fall. And remember, in 1974, the Conveyancing Act had come into force. In 1974, the surviving spouse transferred the property to another person. And so, when the, the surviving spouse who died, there was an issue about whether, when the wife died in 19, whether at the time, it was the whole property that went to the surviving spouse. Or the property had to go to the surviving spouse and then the children. In which case, if it went to the surviving spouse and the children, before the husband sells it, he must also seek the consent and approval of the children. So remember, I'm saying in 1954, Mr. and Mrs. Fenuku jointly acquired the land. But Mrs. Fenuku died in 58. And later on, Mr. Fenuku alone sold the property to somebody. And when they have all died, the issue has arisen about whether at the time that the Mrs. Fenuku died in 1958, whether the property went to Mr. Fenuku alone 
or it went to he and then the children. This is what the Supreme Court said. The court noted, and I quote, that in the instant case, at the time of the death of the wife in 1958, in the instant case, at the time of the death of the wife in 1958, the existing law was the same English common law. And since there had not been any partitioning of the disputed property at the time of the death of the wife. In the 1954 deed of purchase, Exhibit B, created a joint tenancy, which by operation of law, vested the whole property in the husband. It means that the court noted that since the property was acquired in 1954, and at the time, the applicable law was the English common law. And remember, we have said, that the, and under the English common law, when people acquire properties together, there's a presumption that they hold it as joint tenants. So the court held that since the woman died in 58, then the right of survivorship had already kicked in and given everything to the husband. So the husband alone was the one entitled to have a share in the property because of the use acrescendi. This is Fenuku versus John Tay. 2001-2002, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Reports at page 985. So this brings us to the end of our discussion on co-ownership. We have discussed co-ownership, we've discussed joint tenancy, we've looked at the characteristic of joint tenancy, that is the right of survivorship, use acquiescendi. We have looked at the four unities, unity of time, unity of title, unity of interest, and unity of possession. We have seen how you can terminate a joint tenancy in the case of Williams and Hensden. And we have seen also that in Ghana, when you acquire property because of section 40, section three of the Land Act, there's a presumption in favor of tenancy in common. And you've seen how the law has been applicable in Ghana in the case of Tenuku and another versus John Tay and another. 2001-2002 Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report at page 985. This is the end of our discussion on co-ownership. Thank you.